Welcome everyone. We're nearing the end of this iceberg and it feels like a long time coming. The dark side of the internet has so many of these stories that it could take years to sift through them all. Let's cut through the usual and just get to the iceberg. This is the Disturbing Ritual Creepypasta Iceberg 4. I hope you all enjoy this dive. The Soul Game is the first ritual pasta on this tier, and again we're starting off with a pretty good one. The Soul Game was posted on r slash no sleep in 2012, and starts off with an apology. The narrator wants to apologize to everyone that is reading this post. All that they ask is that you read the entire post until the end. The narrator introduces herself as Andrea, and says that she is a single mother. She then remarks that it was hard, but her child made it all worth it. One day her son, named Jesse, had made a new friend at school. The kid's name was Stan. After picking up her son from school, he started a story about how Stan had become his best friend. This is all that Jesse was talking about for a while. He was adamant about his new best friend, Stan. A week passed and Jesse had come home with some pretty big news. He had joined a church during recess. The Church of Stan. This was all starting to get a little weird, Andrea noted. Her son was also starting to act weird. He seemed more timid, almost like he was sick. He was pale when he got home from school, but all he would talk about was Stan. Andrea picked up her son from school and he was looking worse than usual. When she asked what was wrong, he said that they'd played the soul game at school. The soul game didn't sound familiar to her, but the way her son looked didn't make the game seem innocent. When she asked Jesse about it, he freaked out. He said he didn't want to play it, but that Stan said he wouldn't be his friend anymore. Jesse told his mom that he couldn't explain to her what the soul game was. Andrea decided that her son just needed sleep and she would ask him about it again later. She awoke to him screaming that night. Something about the soul game. No amount of consoling would stop his crying, but he eventually tired himself out and fell asleep in her bed, but not before saying that he would tell her the rules of the soul game tomorrow. In the morning, Jesse was tired and lethargic. Still, he went to school. It wasn't for long though, as he vomited in class and needed to get picked up. Andrea picked up her son, who looked just as bad as he had that morning. Jesse then asked if Stan could come over today. Andrea said that he was sick and that it probably wouldn't be the right time. Eventually, she relented, though, and said yes. The back and forth was very odd, Andrea thought. When they got home, no less than ten minutes passed before there was a knock at the door. Andrea opened it to see two small children standing on her porch. They were Stan and his sister, she found out. Stan then started to explain the rules of the soul game. It's really quite simple. Rule 1. Don't walk past mirrors in the dark. Rule 2. Don't leave any doors open when you go to bed tonight. Ask your son what rule 3 is and remember, a creak means you're falling behind, a rustle means you've almost lost. When the lights go down, hopefully you won't see the dark shadow standing in the corner of the room. Hopefully you won't hear breathing as you shut your eyes and you begin to drift off. And if you hear a bang, well, hopefully you never hear a bang. The two children, Stan and Devin, left after that. Andrea turned to her son and asked him what the third rule was. Through tears, Jesse said that knowing all three rules makes you a player. Stan and Devin like to let you know when they get near. Andrea asked how you can win the game. Jesse said, you win if you tell more people the rules of the soul game than told you. Andrea again says that she's sorry to r slash no sleep. She's finally ready to be free and to give her best to Stan and Devin for her. You'll likely see them tonight. This is an excellent ritual pasta and a great start to this tier. The setup of apologizing before the story starts is great at establishing the intrigue, and it is executed very well with the ending. By the time you figure out what was going on, it's too late and you are a player in the soul game. A promising start to this tier, so let's go to the next one. The Librarian Ritual is a ritual that feels more in line with many of the ones we've already covered on this iceberg. It's a ritual that teeters between not worth attempting and a worthy risk for reward. 
That mainly comes from the risk portion. Let's take a look at this ritual. The librarian ritual is one that has a higher chance of working in a library. This is where the name comes from, as the entity that you will be summoning is called the librarian. The entity can be summoned elsewhere, but at a lower rate of success. The list of items for this ritual are 13 candles, a book which is an ideology that has led to the deaths of people, this could be religious or not, a quill, drops of your own blood, enough to write with, a small desk or table, a sharp knife, matches, and a handgun. Note, if you have multiple people conducting this ritual, they'll also need to bring their own stuff. In order to perform this ritual, it'll need to be between the hours of 12 a.m. and 4 a.m. This ritual hasn't been observed outside of those times. You could try it, but there's no telling if it'll work or not. Step one, find a spacious area with many exits. Step two, place the candles in a circle in the center of the room. Step three, position the desk or table in the center of the circle. Step four, place your book of choice on the desk or table. Step five, take the quill and draw a large circle with your blood on the first page of the book. Step six, write the name of everyone who is participating within the circle of blood. Everyone must use their own blood for this. Step seven, you must say, what is the most powerful weapon? You should hear a loud voice boom back, knowledge. Next, you must stab the book and make sure that each name gets cut by the incision. You should feel a presence among you. It'll feel like a chill running down your spine, and you may even see a shadow out of the corner of your eye. The librarian has deemed you worthy of your prize. You will receive an enhanced mental capacity beyond most. You have just signed a blood contract with the librarian, and you two are now connected. If you did this in a group, none of you can contact each other after the ritual is over. You might be wondering about the handgun. Well, you only need to bring two bullets per handgun. If the librarian deems you not worthy, then it'll appear in the room and be visible to all. You must shoot the librarian to stop it. If the bullet has no effect, then it's best to turn the gun the other way. The librarian will do unspeakable things to you and it's better not to see what those are. The librarian ritual sounds very interesting to me. It's so simple, of course. Well, mostly. It keeps in line with the pursuit of knowledge angle that a lot of these rituals go for. Knowledge, after all, is one of the most powerful things to have. I like the length in that it can be done in groups. A group ritual always gives it a fun edge, as it can be tried with friends or like-minded individuals. Of course, being alone makes these rituals far scarier. I'm not sure how the librarian decides who is worthy of knowledge, so that makes it a bit of a major risk to me. You are tempting fate, but also the pursuit of knowledge is a very valiant one. The Devil Face Ritual is split into two parts, one part ritual and one part cautionary tale. What the ritual does is in the title, it lets you see the face of the devil in a mirror. This was a popular ritual in Spain and played mainly amongst teenagers. The ritual doesn't require much, 12 black candles, a mirror, and a room with no light. This can be easily done in any bathroom. Go into your desired room and turn off the lights. Stand in front of the mirror and light the 12 black candles. Close your eyes and keep them closed until the clock strikes midnight. Open your eyes and you should see the devil. What this ritual doesn't say is why you'd want to see the devil. There doesn't seem to be a reward attached. It could also be more of a test of courage style ritual, in which case it doesn't seem viable. The cautionary tale is about a Spanish teen who was trying to impress some girls at a party. The party had turned to scary stories as a lot of them do. A girl had told the story of the devil face ritual to everyone. This story, above all the others, had scared the group. Eventually, the one boy had said he would attempt the ritual. This led to the other boys of the party going out for black candles, while many of the other party goers urged him not to try it. Of course, as pride dictates, he couldn't stop once he said he would do it. He took the stuff into the bathroom and locked the door. As the clock struck midnight, nothing happened. The door to the bathroom didn't open or move at all. Everyone started to get worried, as there was no answer to the knocking. They got a crowbar and removed the door. What they found was the boy lying on the floor in a crumpled heap. From that day onward, he wasn't able to speak and was paralyzed on one side of his body. He had suffered a stroke, the doctor said. They don't know what caused it, but the teens of the party say they do. This is our once a tier devil related ritual. We have had one or two at almost every tier since the beginning. This one is a little different though. This ritual does something that I love, and that's leaving it mostly to your imagination. How to do the ritual is explained, but nothing beyond that. 
There's no specific reward listed, no penalties, just an opportunity. The latter half of the story with the cautionary tale really makes this one creepier. I like the story overall and definitely a fun story to tell around a campfire. How to Summon the Dead in Three Simplish Steps is a story that was posted on r slash no sleep. It was created by the Jesse Clark and teaches the reader how to become a psychic medium. This story was removed from r slash no sleep before being allowed during The Purge, where it was posted again in 2018. The narrator of the story explains how one can become a psychic medium. They offer a service, for a fee of course, that will test if you have what it takes. They highly recommend that you evaluate yourself first before paying for the course though. What they mean by that is to check if you have any latent psychic abilities. Being able to perceive messages from heaven or hell, knowing when or where something bad will happen, or having any sort of premonition is a good place to start. And you must absolutely be sure of what you're feeling, as being a medium is hard enough if you have the tools, and impossible to do if you do not. The narrator explains how being a medium works, talking to dead relatives, exploring the planes of hell, of which there are four, and reading people's fortunes are just a few of the jobs you might get. Being able to talk to the dead is probably the most common, and for this specific task, you must be very prepared. You'll have to transcend your physical being and travel to one of the four layers of hell. The first layer is just a vast emptiness, where most spirits reside until judgment is ready for them. The second layer is for liars and cheaters, scammers and thieves. This layer is mostly for those that were bad people in life, but not so bad to end up in the next layer. Layer 3 is where the worst of the worst reside. Those who have conducted historical atrocities, murderers, and the like all reside here. They face eternal torture and damnation. This layer is where all serial killers end up, and it's a fate worse than death. The fourth layer isn't really described in the story, it is simply titled the Lake of Fire. It is a stereotypical view of hell, though not much more is mentioned about it. It just exists for now. Each layer of hell is accessible by the medium but it is advised to only access the first two layers. The third has roaming demons who would jump at the chance to take your body for a ride. You'll need to find the person you are trying to make contact with and move as quickly as possible. So let's go over what we've learned. In order to summon the dead, we must have at least some psychic ability. Step two is to know who you are trying to summon and what they've done in their life. Step three is to go to the layer of hell that they might reside in and bring them back. That doesn't sound so hard. Of course, you might have to deal with some demons along the way, or a body possession or two. Nothing someone with enough training can't handle. That's how to summon a demon in three simplest steps. It's not a bad story, really well written and engaging enough for its length. The story is less of a ritual and more of a guide on how to become a medium. The ritual comes in the form of how to actually summon the demon. It doesn't go heavily into detail, just explains the concepts. I don't mind that as it's a break from lots of the mirrors and candles. There's nothing wrong with mirrors and candles, of course, but we have a lot of them. So the story is good and I would love to see more from this concept. How to Speak with the Dead is a rather short ritual pasta, so I'll be reading it word for word. Do you have a dead relative? Have you ever wanted to say goodbye but it was too late? This is a way you can talk to one of your dead relatives, maybe a grandparent, a mother, a father, a son, a daughter. Well, this is the way you can do that. But be aware, you are going to be tampering with evil forces whom you can't control. Go to the cemetery in which the relative is buried at exactly 4am, any other time will not work. You must go to the gravestone of the relative is buried in. Be quiet, this is very vital to your safety. Approach the grave, do not use any tools that emit light, however dark it might be. You must approach the gravestone and slowly, oh so slowly, get down on your hands and knees and close your eyes and sing this. Obsecro autum vos de sepultro tuo, ex acterna tua somus, apiri oculus tuos et animo pergabat. Keep your eyes closed and in two to four minutes you will feel something touch your arm. Do not get scared and do not open your eyes. If you want to see him, he will not like it. After the being lets go of your arm, you may open your eyes. 
you will see the relatives sitting on their knees. They will look the way you best remember them as. Unfortunately, their eyes will not be renewed, leaving them rather filmed or gone completely. You cannot talk to the entity like they once were. To initiate conversation, you must ask, how have you been? The only thing they will ever say is, I am doing fine, you? The only thing you can say is, I am doing just fine, thank you. Anything else will displease them. If you say anything else, you have a 50-50 shot of them disappearing and your throat being slit. After this, she or he will ask, may I hug you? Do not answer. If you say yes, they will grab you by your leg and drag you down with them for eternity. If you say no, they will be displeased. You have a 50-50 chance of them slitting your throat or leaving. To counter this, you must say, I would like to speak to the name of the dead relative. Say this in an asserting tone, but be cautious. You wouldn't want to get them mad, would you? At this time, they will nod their head. You must close your eyes. Again, you will feel a touch. Not the same touch, a familiar touch. You may now open your eyes and you will see the exact same figure you saw before, only this time, they will be the relative. Do not film or attempt to bring them out of the graveyard. Any attempts at this will have a very displeasing outcome. Also, do not bring anyone with you. You go alone. You may now talk to the relatives as you remember them. This is the time when you were able to say goodbye or even ask them what death is like. If you want to end the conversation, all you must say is goodbye, their name. Hope to see you soon. At this time, you must close your eyes once again. When you open them, they will be gone for good. Any other attempt to say goodbye will result in them not listening to you. They will follow you out of the cemetery in which you will be slaughtered. Don't be sad when they leave, or you will be hearing from them soon. A very short creepypasta and kind of a bland one, really. The ritual itself is easy enough to do, you just need to break into a graveyard. After that, you can do some reciting on the ground and you're in. The downside is really risky, though. The entity you summon has a 50% chance of just taking you down with them. Those are not great odds. I would never attempt this one, and that's probably for the best. Cursed Key is another short creepypasta. This one can be found on both the Creepypasta Wiki and the Horror Amino app. I will be reading this one in full again. Have you ever hated someone so much that the only thing you want to do is to put them through misery and pain? If so, you have come to the right place. This curse was used on Japanese spies that went rogue in the ages of the samurai, and is still used by secret organizations today as a form of unnoticeable torture. The target will be plagued by misfortune, which could range from minor injuries all the way to deadly situations from which the subject cannot escape. This is also used by the Indians after the technique was discovered in the late 1800s. It is important not to speak about what you have done to anyone, otherwise the curse will have the opposite effect. This happens for reasons unknown. Since its creation was originally used for wooden keys of that era, it was modified by the aforementioned secret organizations in the late 1900s to affect metal keys. To begin, you will need one of the subject's keys. You must make sure that it is not an important key, since important keys are easily missed by owners. You might have a hard time even getting close to your victim's key ring, but after you acquire this, you will need the following. Ash of a burnt down tree, log sticks to capture a spirit, a silver container to make sure that the spirit does not escape while it was captured, a knife or sharp object to anger the spirit by stabbing it, rice to make sure that the spirit can become more powerful and do more harm, a pen and piece of paper to make sure that the spirit hits the right target, Salt is a precaution to pour around the silver to contain, so if the spirit escapes both the ash and silver container, this will provide you with enough time to complete the ritual if the spirit is very strong. Water to lay the container in, maybe inside of a sink or something else, just as long as you can retrieve it again in a short amount of time. If you have the above mentioned, then follow the steps to begin the ritual. Pour the ash into your silver container and begin to pour the salt around the silver container. These are your three titanium walls, blocking the spirit trying to attack you. Now place the key inside the ash slowly. Chant, I've got a treat for you, 15 times. After five minutes, take your knife or sharp object and stab the ash, which is now the spirit's body, eight times, which will anger it and make it stronger. 
Now pour the rice into the silver container. This will cause the curse effects to become stronger. After pouring the rice, the spirits will be back in the container. If it could escape both the ash and the silver container. Write your target's name on the piece of paper and drop it into the silver container. Go to your water source and let the container soak for 30 minutes. So you can give the spirit time to make the key its home. After 30 minutes, you should take the key out of the container slowly and return it to where you found it. Warning. If the target dies, the spirit will come for you. So cover all openings of your house with salt. Otherwise, you might see the same key appear in your house and you will die. There's not much to say about this story. It's a curse that you can use against your enemies, but also has the possibility of backfiring and taking you out instead. I wouldn't say it's worth it, no matter how much you hated someone. Overall, a fine short ritual pasta, so let's move on to the next one. Let's play a game as a group ritual pasta, meaning it can only be done in a group. This story can be found on the Creepypasta wiki, and I can't find an actual author for this story. The unique factor here is that the ritual pasta has to be played in a large group. In order to play the game, you'll need a group with an equal number of participants. So you can't play with 3, but 6 or even 20 is fine. The more players make the game easier overall, well, sort of. Each player must show up to an abandoned area, building, field, forest, whatever. The players must all be in the same black outfit and all wearing similar masks. The idea is that no one can tell who anyone else is. Hoods are also recommended to conceal hair. Gather everyone in a circle and have everyone start to bang on a similar item. The item must make noise, like pots and pans or bells. The banging is done to call the spirits to your area. The game can only be played at exactly 4am, until sunrise. The play area is decided based on how many people are playing the game. You must evade the spirits, not talk aloud, and never remove your masks. Spirits can try all manner of things to get you to either speak or remove your mask. If you are tricked by a spirit, then they will kill you and take you with them. You will be a spirit in the game for the next group of players. You have to kill one of them in order to be free from whatever torment awaits you. When the game is over and you survive the night, you'll get your reward. The reward is to have greater luck and fortune. Yeah, not the most exciting or diverse, but it's something. Probably not worth dying over though. Let's Play a Game is pretty straightforward. It's another short story, but I didn't feel like this one should be read in full. The game itself is unique and sounds like a fun game to play on Halloween, but the reward and risk are a bit wonky. For starters, you'll be killed and forced to become a spirit and play this game until you win. That doesn't sound great. And the reward is getting to have better luck. I'm not sure I like the odds here, really. A fine short creepypasta, but could be better, so on to the next one. The Red Book, or El Juego de Libro Rojo, is a popular game played in Mexico. The game uses a book to ask questions of spirits and the divine. It's a pretty interesting game overall and very creative. In order to play the game, you'll need a book with a red cover. The cover shouldn't have any illustrations on it. The game can only be played with two or more people, making it a great Halloween or party ritual. The first player places their hand on the book and says, Red Book, can I enter your game? Keeping your eyes closed, you'll then flip to a random page and place your finger on a random sentence. You have to interpret the sentence as either yes, no, or undefined. If it's undefined, you'll need to start from the beginning. Each player will then take turns asking questions and flipping through the book to a random page. The sentence they land on will answer the question they ask. You can do this for as long as you like. Once you're done, you have to ask the red book to end the game. Each player has to ask for permission to leave. Only then will the game really end. This is a pretty simple ritual, but it's very creative. I actually used to do this as a writing exercise. I would create a prompt by grabbing a random book and flipping to a page and sentence. I would then write a short story based on whatever sentence I landed on. I also needed to use that line in some way in my story. It was a fun writing exercise. This story feels very similar and I really enjoy its unique take on a paranormal game. Just make sure to get permission to leave the game at the end, otherwise there will be consequences. The Vegas Illusion is a short ritual creepypasta posted on the creepypasta wiki in 2013 and was created by J. Stan Shocker. 
This one requires you to travel to Las Vegas, which to many sounds like a good time. If you're willing to make the trip out there, you might as well enjoy the magic shows. Now, this ritual pasta states that there is a real magic show that can be found in Vegas. It's just not on the strip. Now you'll have to head into the desert in order to find it. If you're interested, that is. Leave the strip behind, go past the airport, and drive until you see nothing but sand. This will need to be done after midnight. You need to exit your vehicle when you can't see the Vegas lights behind you and close your eyes. When you open them, you'll see a motel shrouded in a dark mist. Walk up to it and go inside. It will be lit and seem like an ordinary hotel. Keep going until you get to a set of double doors. Open them to reveal a grand show before you. This is the magic show of master illusionist Melfisto Centurion. Every seat in the house will be packed save for one at the very front of the crowd. Take it. This seat was reserved specifically for you. The magic show will seem even more real than any you've seen before. Tricks that seem impossible will be done with ease. Even if you know it's fake, you can't believe your eyes as you watch. That's when Melfisto will ask for a volunteer to make disappear. The spotlights will shine on you. You can't say no. Not with everyone cheering you on from the crowd. So you'll get up and head to the stage. You'll notice Mephisto stands at around 7 feet tall. He'll have you step on a platform and begin to chant in a language you've never heard before. His eyes will start to glow, and before you can react, you'll be encased in light. You'll be teleported to different locations. First in a lion's den. But just as the lion is about to chow you down, you'll make it to a new location. Each location will be dangerous, but you'll always escape just in time for the danger to get you. Finally, you'll end up back in your seat with a near heart attack. The crowd will cheer and Mephisto will give a bow before disappearing in a poof of smoke. With the show over, you can either stay and chat up the other members of the crowd or leave. As soon as you step out of the hotel, you'll black out. When you wake up, it'll be in the hotel room you'd rented in Vegas. Of course you'll want to look up Mephisto, but you won't find much. Just a single article about a fire that took the life of a magician of the same name. This story is unique for a multitude of reasons. The premise of a secret magic show in Vegas is pretty cool. It could be done anywhere, but with the other magic shows that Vegas puts on, it's a good fit. My only problem was the ending. I left it a part that goes a little bit deeper into what happened to Mephisto. He was actually making a sacrifice to some ancient god in order to get the powers he has. It also explains that he caused the fire and took many of the viewers there with him. This is all fine and good, but then the narrator of the story explains that they are the creator of the magic realm, and that's what I know about all this. Also, now you are dead. Yes, if you did this ritual, you're now dead. I just don't really like that sort of ending. It's not bad, but definitely takes me out of the story a bit. Where I cut it off is a better place to end, I think. A little mystery goes a long way, especially in horror. The Yggdrasil Ritual is a ritual pasta that is similar in concept to the elevator game. It was created by Alice Seeger and was uploaded to the Creepypasta wiki in 2020. The Creepypasta states that in North mythology, people believed in a world tree known as Yggdrasil. This world tree held multiple realms on it, each with very different inhabitants. Many would know Valhalla as the realm where warriors who passed in this life will end up. In order to conduct this ritual, you'll need a building with exactly 9 floors and a working elevator. You have to do some chants and travel between floors, but once that's done, you can enter the different realms. Honestly, there's not much more to say about this ritual. It's pretty straightforward and doesn't really do anything new, except in the instance where you accidentally exit the elevator before the ritual is complete. There's a chance you can end up in an alternate version of our current world, one where different world events have taken place. No JFK assassination, Japan had never entered World War II, or even the Soviet Union winning the Cold War. You can escape this alternate reality by conducting the ritual again. This ritual pasta kind of lacks one important thing though, the horror. It's not scary at all and feels more like a ritual for living out a fantasy novel. Of course there are dangers to leaving the elevator and getting off in one of the nine realms, but those aren't really that scary. I would have liked more options for the actual ritual too. It just kind of tells you how to do it and it's not that hard at all. There's not really a reward except to see the other realms, which could be pretty cool. Without the horror though, this story is just missing that bite.
The Fortune Game, Suchiora, or the Crossroads Divination are all names for the same ritual. This ritual is to have someone read your fortune, an unknown entity. This story has spread heavily online and it's hard to find an exact source, other than it being Japanese in origin. Suchiora are actually rice crackers with a fortune attached, similar to American fortune cookies. This ritual will require a comb, something to cover the participant's face, and for them to go to the crossroads at night. It doesn't specify if it needs to be close to midnight or anything, but that is closer to when paranormal events happen, so it's a safe bet. Take the comb and run your fingers along its teeth. Repeat this three times. Suchiora, Suchiora, grant me a true response. Then you'll have to wait for an unspecified amount of time. If someone you know approaches the crossroads, the ritual has failed. If a significant amount of time has passed and no one shows up, then it has failed. Only if a stranger shows up at the crossroads is when you know the ritual has been successful. As soon as a stranger approaches, cover your face. You must ask them to read your fortune. Be as polite as possible. They will just say yes, nothing, or no. If they say no or nothing, then keep the face covering up and wait for them to leave. When a stranger walks up and they answer with yes, you will have your fortune told. This can be anything. You can't ask for a specific reading though, and must listen to whatever you're being told. Even if it's not what you wanted to hear, know that it is true. The stranger is incapable of lying to you. That is your fortune and outcome. Thank them for the reading and keep your mask up until you know they are gone. Now you know some aspects of your fate. Take this knowledge and do with it as you will. It has been said that some take their own lives after finding out their fate. So is it really worth it? That's for you to decide. This is a short but interesting ritual. It requires a few items, but promises just about what you put in. Knowing your future could be really useful, but you don't really get to pick here. That's a pretty interesting aspect, I suppose. Not bad overall. The Answer Man is a popular ritual that seemed to gain infamy around 2014. It was popular mainly in Asia and has big requirements to even start it. It will require 10 people and 10 disposable cell phones. In order to play the game, gather your 10 friends with their cell phones into a circle. Each person must get the phone number from the person to the right of them. When everyone has each other's numbers, you must all dial at once. This means the person to the left must dial to the person to the right's number, and this must continue all the way around the circle. If all the calls either fail or end up on busy tones, the ritual has failed. You can either try again or call it here. In order to actually complete this ritual, one phone must get through to an unknown voice. The one caller is the lucky one who gets to talk to the answer man. They are allowed to ask any question of the answer man, and they will receive an answer in return. Then the answer man gets to ask his question. The questions will likely be something deeply personal, but you must answer truthfully. You can ask as many questions as you'd like, but for every question you ask, he may ask one back. Once you're done asking questions, you have to tell the answer man that you have to go. He may try to stop you by saying he'll answer more questions for free, but do not take his offer. Every question comes with a cost. Keep politely telling him that you have to go. Eventually he will rescind and hang up. This is when you are officially allowed to hang up. Everyone must burn their phones afterwards. Here's some rules to follow. Do not put the answer man on speakerphone or pass the phone around. The answer man chose who we wanted to talk to for a reason. Do not accept his offer for a free question. He'll likely make the question he asks impossible for you to answer, in which case he'll claim a piece of you. Make sure every phone is burned beyond repair. These phones are now attached to the other side and you don't want to answer any calls from there. And most importantly, do not hang up on the answer man. He won't like that. The Answer Man is another ritual that feels like it would make an interesting movie. 10 people, 10 phones, something like that as a tagline. The ritual itself is interesting as well. It is a different take on the formula of answering and asking questions of a dark entity. The picture game is a ritual that will require a camera. Cameras hold some paranormal significance as many people have claimed to see spirits only through the lens. Pictures of ghosts are actually one of the most common pieces of evidence presented for ghosts, spirits, and phantoms. This ritual will require a camera with flash, camera phones not recommended, a piece of string or rope, 
a glass, bottle of wine, scissors, or a knife, and one small mirror per participant. This game can be played with two or more people, though it is advised to have more than two. The game starts at midnight. Make a circle with the rope or string and place it in the center of a quiet room. Pour the wine in the glass and place it inside of the circle. Do not step into the circle during the setup or during the game. Now everyone must sit in a circle around the rope or string circle. All participants must place their mirror on the ground in front of them. Each mirror should be pointing towards the ceiling. Finally, turn out the lights. All participants must close their eyes, hold hands, and say, I trust you. Each person should say this individually, and not in unison. Then they must say in unison, the door is open, please come in. The camera then gets passed around and you need to take a picture towards the center of the circle. Every participant must take two pictures. That is unless they feel uneasy or nauseous, then they must be skipped. After that is done, another phrase must be repeated in unison. It is time to go home. Everyone needs to flip their mirror over, the lights should be turned on, and the rope should be cut with a scissors or knife. Finally, the wine must be taken outside and dumped onto a patch of grass or dirt. Now you are allowed to look over the photos you took. There's a chance you'll see a ghostly apparition in every photo. Important to note, if someone said they were feeling scared during the ritual but still took a photo, do not look at that photo and destroy the camera. Not much more to say about this ritual. This could be a fun party trick at a kid's sleepover, but the requirements of wine makes that impossible. I still think I can get a few friends over to try it out though. The corner game is one that's hard to track down an origin for. It appears to be from a part of Asia, but I'm not sure which country. It was popular for a while before coming to the West. The corner game requires four participants, an empty room with four corners, and the ability to say your own name backwards. Gather up your four players and head to the room where you wish to play the game. The house must be empty. No additional people or pets are allowed inside during the game. This can be hard for many. Before you actually start the game, a speaker must be picked. Only the speaker can talk during the game. Once they've been decided on, you must enter the room and say your name three times. Everyone must go to a different corner of the room and the lights need to be turned off. All players need to face the corner directly and have their backs pointed toward the center of the room. Once everyone is in position, the speaker needs to count to three. On three, all players need to start moving clockwise towards the next corner of the room. This step needs to be repeated until you're ready to stop the game. If one of the players goes missing during the game, or another entity has appeared in the room with you, you must alert the speaker without speaking and start the completion ceremony. To do this, every player needs to gather near a light switch and say their names backwards three times then turn on the light. The last player should appear in the room with you now. They won't know what happened, just that everyone was gone for some reason. There's a chance that they won't come back, and if that happens, good luck. The most important rule here is to not speak during the game. You don't want to know what will happen if you do. The corner game is a very simple ritual that requires four players. I do like group rituals, as it feels like there's more fun in everyone participating. Of course, this particular game doesn't seem to offer much except for a chance meeting with a spirit or entity. It could still be an interesting encounter, though you could also lose someone randomly, with no chance of them ever coming back. For the final ritual pasta on this tier, we have another short one. I'll be reading it in full and then going over it afterwards. This is one of them. Any night around 10 or 11 p.m., take yourself to a flat, open area where you can walk in a straight line for two minutes or so without running into anything. Once there, face in the direction you plan to walk with your arms at your sides and your hands relaxed. Close your eyes and take a deep breath. At precisely 11.09 and 20 seconds, start walking. Be sure to take one step every second, no more, no less. Do not open your eyes and do not hesitate. Count your steps in your head as you go. On the 111th step, say the word one out loud and stop. Your breath will catch in your throat and your hair will stand on end. For the next 10 seconds, you will be unable to move a single muscle in your body no matter how hard you try. After these 10 seconds, you will be able to move again and breathe. However, you will then start to feel the sensation of a cold metal claws seizing each of your fingers by the base and plucking them clean off your hand. It will not hurt. You will surely be horrified though. But do not open your eyes and do not move. If you move or open your eyes, 
All that anyone will ever find of you is your two fingerless hands severed cleanly at the wrist. Once the claws have stopped and all the fingers have been plucked off, stay still for another 10 seconds. It may help to count. After these 10 seconds have passed, you may open your eyes. You may find that your fingers are still quite firmly attached to your hands. Go home immediately and go directly to bed. Speak to no one for the rest of the night and enter no building that you do not consider your home. The next day you will become one of them. Once per day, as long as there is even a sliver of sunlight left, you may point at someone and speak the word one. That night, he will face the same trial that you faced. If you see the person the next day, you will know that he too has become one of them. If not, then do not be alarmed if you do not feel hungry for the rest of the day. One of them is such a strange but interesting creepypasta. The ritual is pretty short and easy to do if you're good at managing and keeping track of time. Of course, you also need to live in a safe area to travel around at night. The entity of the way it is described is pretty creepy, especially since we know almost nothing about it. I really like the ending where it can be assumed multiple things have happened. One, that you, as one of them, ate the person you pointed at. Or two, that you have fed the entity and it in return has taken away your need to eat for that day. Thanks everyone for watching part 4 of the Ritual Creepypasta Iceberg. The next part will be the complete iceberg and it will be around 4-5 to five hours long. The usual for these complete icebergs. I will be announcing the next iceberg at the end of that iceberg as well, so be sure to stick around for that. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters, Blow and O's, and Nora Kingsley for helping me keep this channel creepy and dark. Thanks everyone for watching my content and supporting me. Hope to see you all in the next video.